<laughs> welcome, welcome. So we have people that are still joining. I am just sending um, a Facebook alert and then we can get started. Okay. I am ready for you. You are ready for me. Good, because I'm ready for you too. And I'm really excited about this topic. It's nice to see you. And um, you were sure is very appropriate. <laughs> Well, it is about intimacy and aging and being early, so yes. <laughs> if you don't tell me, everything is like the Valentine's Day come early. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I'll get feisty after, who knows. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, how about yes. if we get started, I'm going to do an official introduction and then, um, then we will dive in. Sound good? Excellent. Okay, so um, I'm going to take a pause for a moment. We do already have people on Zoom. We have them on Facebook, and let me just set this up. Welcome to tonight's episode of Women's Wellness and Fertility with Dr. Dow and myself. Uh, we are very happy to have you join us tonight. Tonight's topic is a really interesting one. It is all about uh, when does a woman reach her prime in terms of sexuality and aging? So tonight we are going to ask all those questions of Dr. Dow that you have wanted to know about hormones, about sexuality, um, understanding how your body works in terms of um, moving from phase to phase, from being a teenager to being in your 20s, to moving into midlife, and then moving to be and beyond. Uh, so I'm sure there's all sorts of questions that I know I have, and I hope that you do as well. Um, what we would ask is that you please hold your questions till towards the end of the chat and then you have two options for being able to um, submit your questions first of all uh, if you are on Facebook Leah Jonas our operations director is on there with you and she will handhold you through the process uh, you're able to put any comments or questions into the chat box and she will send those our way and then if you're here on zoom with us uh, as well, at the bottom of your menu, you have an option to um, use the chat mechanism, or you also can raise a hand and we will unmute you at the end so you can ask your question that way. Uh, so we hope you enjoyed tonight's episode. And with that, again, thank you, Dr. Dow, for joining us. Um, let's go into this. Uh, so here's my first question for you about hormones. Let's start mm -hmm. with hormones and then mm -hmm. work our way through some of these phases in life. Mm -hmm. So we know that there are mental uh, factors, there's emotional factors, there's physical factors that impact a woman's health. Um, but often what isn't discussed that much um, in the media is about how to balance your hormones. So why do you feel this topic is important for tonight? Well, I think it's important to understand that a big part of a woman's life is in the reproductive cycle. Mm -hmm. So the reproductive cycle starts when you actually have a menstruation, when you start ovulating. Mm -hmm. And that could be, you know, for a lot of women is ages from 10 to 14 years old. Um, and then it can, uh, and actually some people also ovulate a little bit later. Okay. But during that period of time, we call menarche. And then all the way to the time when you um, lose uh, your period, which on the average age is around 50-ish, about 50 years old. And that's mm -hmm. when we start to uh, uh, seize uh, menstruation. So that's a pretty big chunk of time. If you think on the average age, 14 to 50, you're talking about somewhere around 36 years right. of a reproductive cycle. And that period of time, you're very much in some ways uh, protected uh, by estrogen and progesterone in some ways in the sense of your health, in a sense of um, your um, ovulation, your body is um, trying to prepare yourself every cycle to try to get pregnant and have children. Um, that's what your body has been designed for from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, in nature, um, that's uh, as an animal, as a mammal, um, that's our reproductive cycle. So we are very much a factor by the balancing of the hormones. We want our hormone to be strong Mm -hmm. But we also want our hormone to be balanced. So what I mean is that if you have too much hormone run, running in our body, we can uh, create problems. For example, 
we can uh, cause maybe um, a more associated situation such as endometriosis and maybe uh, um, um, fibroid, growth of fibroid, uh, a condition called adenomyosis in the uterus, which is endometriosis growing in the myometrium of the uterus. Mm -hmm. So you can see all that, and that's very possible. So we like to see that the hormone is not out of balance, especially um, estrogen and progesterone, um, both of these uh, hormones, uh, they want, uh, you want them to be synchronized. Mm-hmm. So, um, and you will find that it's not every woman uh, have balance and regular ovulation, regular periods. Um, it is actually, the last time I checked, is somewhere around 8 to 15% of women who actually gets truly regular 28, 29-day cycles. Most That's a women, really small percentage, much smaller than I small, Yes, and most women actually fluctuates. And a lot of women fluctuate only a few days, uh, which is okay, which is normal. It's okay, but it's when you start to fluctuate more than a few days, when you start to go beyond two, three days of fluctuation, when you start to go four days and five days. Mm-hmm. And frequently as we go through <clears throat> perimenopause or premenopause, A lot of time before we go there, we are starting to have ovarian aging. In the ovarian aging, you will start to see that your periods start to come sooner. So instead of, say, 29-day cycle, you're going to start to see like 23-day, 24-day, 25-day, 21-day cycles. When you start to get such short cycle, it either means is that you are uh, ovulating a a little bit too early. ovulating on time, but um, the uh, air quality is not as good. So it's already an indication of ovarian aging when that happens. So balanced hormone is the key, not just in the sense uh, of wanting to get pregnant, but also in the sense of good health. When you don't have a balanced hormone, a lot of times you can have very strong PMS situations, you could have <laughs> other possible diseases, disorder that comes from it. So that's the reason why I think the balance hormones are very, very important during this period of time. Okay. And just to reiterate, what would a healthy cycle look like then for a woman? Well, um, usually it's a 28, 29-day cycle. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, if you are in the range between 27 to 30 day, I think that's reasonably well. Mm-hmm. And uh, you're looking at a period that probably lasts four to five days. When you're younger, mm-hmm. it should last, you know, five to seven days usually because your hormones are robust and it's pretty strong. And when you get older, uh, when you're in the 40s, your period might go to three to five days or so maybe more spotting at that time. Mm-hmm. And the period flow should be more bright red and you shouldn't hesitate. I mean, you should start a nice flow. It shouldn't stop in the middle quite, really quickly. We should mm-hmm. not have that. And then we, sh- we should be minimal of clots and tissues. So if a little bit is normal, it's okay. But when you start to get a profuse amount of clots and uh, tissues, that's usually a sign that a flow is not smooth or there may be fibroids uh, that we need to look at. Uh, beyond that, um, the PMS symptoms, oh, the cramp, you shouldn't have too much cramp at all. If mm-hmm. you have, most of the time you should have some discomfort, but not discomfort where you say, oh my God, I got to lie down, I got to put a hot water bottle on, uh, mm-hmm. I got to take a painkiller. None of those. You should just have a little bit of discomfort. But if you have any pain that requires any kind of medication, that means the pain is strong enough for you to have to reach out for it. And that indicates that it's something that's out of balance. There's some inflammatory activity and uh, it needs to be treated and it can be treated very well uh, through uh, traditional Chinese medicine. Uh, besides that, beyond that, um, we want to see also uh, PMS to be pretty manageable. I mean, you shouldn't have too much PMS, maybe a little breast tenderness, maybe a little bloating. Uh, but you shouldn't get headaches or you shouldn't get really, really exhausted. Then that means is that uh, the hormones, uh, you are getting a very strong effect, effect from the hormones. Mm-hmm. Ovulation, same thing. During your mid-cycle ovulation, you shouldn't be having severe pains. 
mm-hmm. uh, the most you should be having a little twinge. It's almost like a little flutter in your ovary area, in your pelvis area. Mm-hmm. You should also maybe have a little vaginal discharge. And that's about it. You shouldn't have anything else more than that. Um, so that gives you a cycle. So a cycle should be pretty non-eventful. I'm going to use the word non-eventful. Um, and that is what would be a normal cycle be like. Okay, so I have um, a couple of questions based on what you were saying. Before I jump in more on the cycle side of it, you've mentioned fibroids a couple of times. I don't think a lot of women out there know what fibroids are. Could you explain that? Well, fibroid is a benign tumor. It's a growth. It's a growth that most of the time originates from the myometrium of your uterus. Mm -hmm. If you look at a uterus, the uterus actually is a very muscular organ. Okay, Mm -hmm. very muscular. The majority of the tissue is muscles, basically. It's a big clump of muscles. Mm -hmm. And if, and you know, there is a lot of, there's still, we don't always have the best understanding of the cause of fibroid, why these muscle tumors go, and they're benign, by the way, and they are not very likely to convert into a malignant cancer. Most of them are benign. And, Is there a particular uh, age that they come on for women? Well, they usually come on in the the earliest is probably late 20s and then into the 30s and into the 40s. And there's some ethnic differences. For example, African-Americans tends to have um, a lot uh, a lot more uh, African-American tends to have a lot more uh, possibility for these fibroids and while Caucasian has less, for example. Okay. So, um, so that, that is the situation that, that we have. Oh, Dr. Mao, you're putting some light on me. Thank you. <laughs> so I hope I, hope I explained that. Love. Yes, yes, brotherly love. So anyway, so I hope I explained that well. Yes, huh? actually you did, yes. Okay. Um, you know, I think it's interesting because, and actually I'm glad that you addressed that because I don't remember having any friends that uh, had fibroids until we hit our 30s. And then I remember so many of my girlfriends getting it. <laughs> Um, So I've always been curious, is there a particular age that it happens? And I think that not just myself, but a lot of other women and uh, men can relate to that of sometimes not really understanding when these conditions impact a woman um, and what signs to watch for that it might be occurring as well. Right. Well, the fibroid um, usually, I mean, it depends on the location of fibroid. There's a lot of women who are able to conceive and bear children, even with the presence of fibroid. Yes. So it's not like it's a dire straight situation when you have fibroid. It really all depends on the location mm-hmm. and the size of it. Okay, so that's, uh, you know, a lot of time a reproductive endocrinologist can make that assessment for uh, a a, a patient. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, Now let's jump back to the topic of uh, menstruation. And I think that's a good segue into talking about uh, teenage health. Um, One of the things, and you and I have discussed this before, is I remember being a teenager and menstruation was a very taboo subject. Um, I was fortunate to have a mother that felt comfortable discussing this with me, but I literally didn't have a single girlfriend that's mother would discuss it beyond saying, I'm taking you to the market. Here's your sanitary napkins. Good luck. (laughs) And it's a very unusual circumstance for teenage girls to be in because it is a rite of passage in a way. But more honestly, your whole body is going through so many different things. (laughs) on an emotional level, on a physical level, and it's, it's challenging not to have that support. And the only thing that I see changing now as an adult is that there is still very limited information. We have uh, sex education, of course, in the schools now, and that's beneficial. But I think that a lot of um, youth don't know still how to have these conversations with their parents or family members. And likewise, I don't think family members feel entirely comfortable. And that may just be something about American culture. I can only speak for culture here. Um, But something else that I see happening, and I wanted to ask you if you would mind talking about in a very healthy way is 
I see a dynamic going on where when I was younger, uh, just as you were describing, you don't get too much cramps, you don't really get headaches that much. It was never this thing of feeling, we felt like we couldn't talk about it, but we didn't feel excessive pain or shame about it. And what I see with youth now, and you know, I do a lot of mentoring with these young girls, is that I have not ever seen such a large percentage of young women who complain about having cramps, who want to not be in school during those days, who have migraines and headaches, and truly feel like their body is falling apart on them. Um, how yeah. would you give us a discussion for those of us that are adults, how can we talk with young women about this and make them feel empowered and self-confident about something that is so natural and essential to a lifetime for them truly? Well, I think to do that, first of all, you got to gain some knowledge. Okay, mm -hmm. so for a lot of people, even for adults, a lot of time you don't actually have all the knowledge of menstruation, even though you're menstruating yourself. Right. So sometimes, you know, going on Wikipedia or some website such as um, the National Health Institute, National Institute of Health, uh, there is a section on women's health. You could definitely look at menstruation information and get yourself acquainted with that. And there's tons of public resources and books that speci specifically help you to address this issue and talking to your daughter about it. Mm -hmm. um, nowadays, I mean, it really depends on what school you go to. I mean, we are in Los Angeles area, and I can tell you the school, public school, has ample ample amount of education already at that age for their menstruation, sexuality already. I mean, it's not a lack of information. Mm -hmm. It's actually maybe too much information. And that a lot of time, a, a say a 12 or 13 year old girl, they, they may get overwhelmed mm -hmm. by it. So a lot of times this kind of message and this kind of information are gradual. I mean, you want to teach your daughter uh, regarding the menstruation uh, fun early on, but you know, it takes a little time. You don't have to rush and you just gradually teach them about uh, the whole fertility cycle and the importance of eventually understanding their uh, uh, fertility and contraception needs and that kind of stuff later on as they develop into a young adult. Uh, so it's it's a whole continu it's all continuum. Now, if we just focus on menarche, it's it's scary sometimes for young women. All of a sudden, they're bleeding. And so I think it's important and, you know, it's just like any human being, we tend to work better with certainty than uncertainty. Mm -hmm. So in the sense is that sometimes we need to just tell them outright, even those are the most uncomfortable thing for even a mother or father to tell your daughter, it's important just tell them, just tell them, listen, you're going to get a menstruation, which is going to be bleeding. And uh, so I think it's uh, it's important to go through that whole process. Um, and, and you can do it from the, um, shall we say, memo point of view. You can use an animal, uh, telling them, you know, what happens in the animal kingdom. And that way they can say, oh, okay, the animal kingdom gets that. So we as human, we probably most likely will get that. So it kind of helped them to go through that. Uh, but there's one thing I want to, uh, be certain to really tell the parents is that when uh, a girl start having menstruation and they are having really bad cramps uh, or uh, severe symptoms, it's uh, kind of important to check that out right away. Don't wait. Okay, so a lot of times, um, one of the things that a lot of people do is put somebody on birth control pill. Okay, that might be the treatment for it. But it doesn't really necessarily get rid of the condition. So if somebody who, for example, have very severe cramp and have endometriosis, for example, mm -hmm. then the birth control pill will shut it down, okay? But it pushes the can down the road. So what I mean is that you'll deal with it when you get a little bit older. So a lot of time when you come up with birth control pill, the pain returns, and all of a sudden you're having difficulty getting pregnant, okay? So instead of that, uh, in Chinese medicine, we don't do that. What we do is that we try to work on the pain already from day one. So, and if you go to China, if you go to Asia, go to China, mm -hmm. uh, where I was resident in a hospital, 
um, in the OBGYN clinic, uh, OBGYN department, I mean, the parents uh, would basically lift their baby and hug and hold their child and carry the child to our department for treatment. Mm -hmm. Okay, we would do acupuncture treatment, we would do infrared helium, we would do some cupping, we would do some moxa, we would give them some herbs to drink, and we then, you know, take them home, give them some supplements to take home. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, all those things that we do right away. So we are trying to treat the problem instead of trying to take control over the cycle by giving birth control pill. Um, so we don't do it in China, Lawi. We really trying to deal with that inflammatory activity first mm -hmm. so that we can deal with endo. If it's endometriosis, we want to deal with a day one. We don't want to wait until later. Okay, that's very helpful. Um, let's go into health in our 20s. Um, because we can do a whole topic just on teens, but I think we need to keep moving forward. So health in our 20s. Uh, this is a very big period, a very big phase of growth. Um, a lot of women become sexually active during this period, if not earlier. Um, and also, again, they're experiencing a lot of hormone changes. How would you describe the 20s in a woman's life in terms of what she should be aware of um, and what you like those points you want her to take into consideration essentially okay if you're talking about sexuality having sex in the early 20s i think the very first thing is that there's an elephant in the room that's hpv mm -hmm. the trendy topic these days is sexually transmitted diseases you don't want to get it okay you don't want to have it okay it's no fun and some of the disease once you have it it's lifetime like hiv Sure, we have good drugs. We can put that in remission now. It's wow. not as, you know, crazy the um, deadly as before, and we can definitely manage that now. But why? You know, why couldn't we? So I think the very first thing in which I am so happy that a lot of schools in this country teach about sexuality early on, and you teach about safe sex. Okay, mm -hmm. um, so. Uh, it's so funny that I, you know, frequently talk to my patients, and I realize because of the 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 uh, the fear of uh, getting pregnant or sexually transmitted diseases, um, a lot of girls are doing oral sex, and yes. it's like thinking, oh, oral sex is safe. Mm -hmm. well, I'm sorry, it's not. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, it's not. You can definitely get HPV. Um, fun oral sex, okay? Mm -hmm. So it's not something, and, and you can get in your mouth area. In fact, you know, it's, um, and I think the key here is there is, as you know recently, there is the HPV uh, vaccination, the human papilloma virus vaccination. Mm -hmm. And it's been very controversial for a lot of people. A lot of people don't just, they don't feel like their girl should get it. And this vaccination is most and probably only effective uh, before you have sexual encounter. Mm -hmm. So in some ways you have to take that into consideration and start thinking about it when your girl is starting to have menstruation. Now, you know, we have a lot of vaccination. Don't get me wrong. Vaccination is in principle, mm -hmm. it's now. Okay, it's sound. It's in fact, I would say Chinese medicine probably was the very first medicine that actually used inoculation. We did inoculation uh, in the old days for smallpox, and that was about a thousand years ago with the Taoist master physician, with uh, Dr. Ge Ho. And uh, he actually came out with an inoculation concept and also practiced smallpox. Mm -hmm. So um, the whole key is to prevent what is not disease, to prevent illness. So um, the principle of inoculation and immunization really works really well. But unfortunately, we have so many inoculation. We have, in the last time, count at least by the time they have five years old, you got about 34, 35 different kind of inoculations. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times, immune system can't handle that well with so much inoculation going on. But um, HPV inoculation is something that you need to consider uh, to do it before uh, a woman, a girl, having sexual activity. Um, you know, I unfortunately, uh, I don't see this a lot. 
but I have seen uh, three or four cases um, in the last few years where that HPV has turned into vaginal cancer, and vaginal cancer has metastasized. And unfortunately, uh, these people, um, um, some of them already passed away, and some are struggling and going, working with it and doing chemo and radiation. I really do my best to help them to really uh, get rid of this terrible, terrible cancer and disease. But these are some of the things that I changed my concept of and thinking about HPV. I think we need to do prevention. So what I mean is that if inoculation is necessary, if the immunization is necessary, and especially also you got to take into consideration of the behaviors of the child. But sometimes that's not even the point. The point is that you could just have sex and you could just get it. Uh, so I think it's important for us to consider. I mean, even nowadays, there's some consideration for boys to do that as well. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, I do want to recommend for people to really consider seriously to do inoculation of HPV before uh, they um, have any kind of sexual contact. Okay. And I, I'm going to ask you this question because but we are... I didn't answer your question. Acne. Oh, That's please. the biggest concern of every girl is acne. Okay. Yes. Now, yeah. yeah. Acne is a big deal and I treat acne whole day long. And there are stuff that you can take. I mean, there are, I mean, some of the most severe acne, you can come in and let us do some acupuncture, let us do some serious herbs to help you. But there's some over the counter stuff that we can use um, that we can definitely use, um, for example, in our repertoire. Um, you know, in the Infinity, uh, we have things that we can use. There's quite a bit. Um, I don't know if you want to get into it, but, um, you know, we can, uh, there's a thing called exquisite skin. Yeah, uh, I, that. That I will show them. I've got it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, some of that you could take and that could already right. be very, very helpful. So there are definitely things that you can do. Uh, even the ancient treasure tea, there's an internal cleanse component to it. Uh, mm -hmm. That can be uh, extremely helpful. Okay. Uh, what about for, well, I, I hope you don't mind, I'm going to back up for a second because I do want to ask you this question because I know our audience is very broad and I think we need to be authentic with this. The same rules that you were just talking about with HPV, would that be applicable to those that are um, sexually active same sex or sexually active bisexual? Do they have additional concerns that they should be aware of or same rules across the board? Um, it's all across the board. It's all across the board because, um, you know, in the uh, 1970s, uh, 60s, 70s, and 80s, we have a lot of herpes situation. Mm -hmm. And so <clears throat> we have developed medication for it, developed herb and acupuncture treatment. I used to treat a lot in the early 80s. I used to treat a lot of people with herpes. But, you know, the beautiful thing about herpes is that it rarely turns into cancer. Right. Okay, it's not a deadly disease. It's an annoying disease, okay? Mm -hmm. But it's not really a deadly disease. So therefore, it's not something you worry about. HPV on the other side is that if you get a specific strain, such as strain number 16 and 18, uh, especially these strains, uh, has a really high um, prevalence of turning into a cancer situation. Mm -hmm. That's a problem. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, let's switch gears a little bit. Still in our 20s, uh, there are individuals that are thinking about starting families and fertility. I know that we are going to next month um, be talking specifically about the fertility topic of um, debunking some of the myths about fertility. But just for tonight, can you tap into some of the considerations you would want uh, individuals to think about if they're preparing for uh, conception? I think in the 20s, I think normally for most people in the 20s, if you just look at a guy, you probably won't get pregnant because that's how fertile you are in some ways. Mm -hmm. uh, I have patients who come in and say, wow, I just have sex around my uh, uh, menstruation time and I'm pregnant. This is ridiculous. I say, yeah, yes. You know, the, the window 
authorization is incredible and the ability for the sperm to live in your body when you are in the early 20s especially is really high yeah. um, so in some ways you, your windows of being able to fertilize and get pregnant is pretty wide pretty wide but a window closes up as you get older mm -hmm. okay so the peak of fertility we say is somewhere around 25 years old Okay. Uh -huh. um, by the time when you hit 30, your fertility has probably gone down about 15 to 20 percent already. By the time you hit 35, it's about 50 percent less mm -hmm. easily by that time. So, um, <clears throat> as an animal, we, you know, you design. You know, as a woman, you're designed to bear a child. So, in some ways, you really want to have your children early if it's mm -hmm. possible. I'm not saying early in the teens. So that would be totally. You're not mature enough, but in the 20s, maybe after college, uh, getting a job, you need to start thinking about uh, maybe get um, if you want to have children, um, get into a family situation, get into a marriage situation, and where you can start thinking about that. Um, and uh, but you know it, this also apply to people who is LGBT community, because even in that community, uh, there are many methodology, many ways we can help an individual to have a family, regardless of their uh, basically their uh, shall we say gender and sexual orientations. Right. Okay. Um, let's talk about 30s. How does a woman's body start changing in her 30s? Besides, I know on a, you know, surface level, we start to see wrinkles, we start to see we don't have our figure quite exactly the same <laughs> way as in our yes. teens and 20s, but what are the real shifts happening that we should be aware of? Hey, did I hear somebody say rolling 30s or rolling 20s? <laughs> <laughs> I, I would say, um, I would like to think it's still rolling 30s, but the oh, reality. I'm rolling 50. <laughs> <laughs> you know, 30 years old, you're starting to have a little bit of sign of aging. Uh -huh. okay. And I think, uh, um, you know, this ovarian, uh, you, you have to understand when you were born, you were endowed with a you know, few million of. Uh, follicles mm -hmm. and by the time when you start menstruating you have probably only a couple hundred thousand of eggs left and your body don't really make more follicles you can okay. make them last longer you can make them rejuvenate you can make them stronger but you kind of start out with what you got okay mm -hmm. so in Chinese medicine we call this kidney essence you start out with whatever kidney essence your parents give to you. Hopefully you didn't abuse your body and you still got quite a bit of follicles. But as you go through time, these follicles start to, you know, you start to lose them as you're having menstruation. So by the time when you're 30 years old, and I hate to say, you know, it's, it's, you, you are re reducing uh, some of these follicles at this certain point. And the follicles, as you reduce the hormones, you know, it's not as robust and as quality or as high as before. So mm -hmm. basically what's going on, you're going to see, and, and as I was saying earlier, hormones are protective in some ways. And that hormone actually really help you um, with the reduction of aging in some ways um, during this reproductive age. So there's appropriate time. So during the 30s, you're starting to have a little mild aging signs, not severe. But you realize, you know, when you were 20s, you can stay up the whole night studying and you'll be okay. But when you're 30s, forget it. You cannot stay up. Mm -hmm. you, just, you would eat it tomorrow. You just can't do it. Okay, so that's the first sign. You start to realize, oh my God, my energy is just not as robust as before. Mm -hmm. uh, so in the 30s, I think the key is get going. If you really want to have a family, get going. Okay, so what I mean is that, look, if you're single, bank your eggs. Okay, bank them as quickly as you can uh, because you never know whether or not you're going to have uh, a boyfriend or girlfriend. You may not be ready by a certain time. You know, the technology, uh, vitrification, and egg freezing is already there. Uh, save some money, bank some of your eggs, sooner the better. Do not bank the eggs beyond 35. Do it earlier than 35 if, if possible. What, how expensive is banking eggs? I mean, that wasn't even a topic when I was in my 30s, but 
it, obviously it's not cheap it's work. definitely yeah it's definitely not cheap but you know the price is going coming down because uh -huh. more it's more utilization more and more people that's using it and there's going to be more competition in the marketplace and the more people doing it then the price is going to gradually go down it's in the thousands it's not cheap it's in the thousands yeah okay uh, what about in terms of um, what else like in terms of sexual arousal, how are our bodies responding in the 30s? Uh, well, you know, sexual arousal in sex is very much, I often say sex starts here. Mm -hmm. Okay, sex starts in your mind. Mm -hmm. Start with your perspective. Start how you feel. So your feeling plays a big role, okay? Mm -hmm. How you feel about the person. I often say, you know, let's make sure you have sex with somebody that you like. Yes. that you love okay <laughs> let's just start there okay right. <laughs> I mean, that's really helpful because otherwise i tell you i don't know how fun that sex is going to be that encounter i believe is a, a very intimate experience and it's a wonderful pleasurable experience and i think it's important to have people liking each other i think that's a good starting point mm -hmm. um and uh, uh i think the sexual arousal does decline with age Okay, mm -hmm. those decline with age, uh, but there is a way that you can really make sure that you can preserve it. And mm -hmm. one of the thing is, um, you know, I hate to say practice. In some ways, you know, if you are not having sex regularly, and I'm not saying that you got to have it every single day. I mean, that's that just sometimes would be just too exhausting for most people. Mm -hmm. But if you have it, maybe, and, and depends on what age. If you have it according to your energy level and according to your partner, it's loving, it's fun, you're exploring each other. And I think that's the key is that trying to make sure that it's exciting, trying to make sure it's not mundane, trying to make sure it's not a responsibility, mm -hmm. trying to make sure you're, just, you're not doing it just to make someone happy. Mm -hmm. You could do that. But let's make sure that it is mutually beneficial in the sense is that it brings happiness to both people. I think that to start with is a foundation for sexual arousal, okay? So now if you're starting to have low hormones and physically you just, the libido is down, you're having some dryness in your vagina, lubrication is weak, and, and you really want it and you really like this person, you really want it, then you might need some help. You know, that's where you can uh, uh, seek a, um, a person who can uh, help you with your uh, sexual function. I, you know, I personally treat a lot of men and women, both with erection, uh, erectile dysfunction, as well as uh, libido uh, declines. Uh, this is a very regular uh, thing that we do. And a lot of times as I work on, especially in a woman, I work on a woman's fertility frequently, uh, majority of time, their libido increases, their lubrication increases. So you can definitely improve uh, sexual function, arousal, uh, and, and the related uh, uh, actions and symptoms and functions. Okay. And can you tell us what is the difference between when we see these over-the-counter lubricants versus the quality of care you're able to provide in the clinics for individuals? Um, uh, I, I'm sorry, repeat that question again? So uh, you were talking about, you know, if, if individuals are experiencing... Um, uh, lubrication issues uh, right. and needing to to foster that up. What is the difference between the products we see, let's say in the drugstore, when we walk in there, versus coming into a clinic and how it would be managed uh, with you or another acupuncturist at the clinic? Well, first of all, you got to assess uh, a patient first. If a woman who might be, say, 50, 60 years old, um, some women go through menopause and sometimes they start to develop vaginal dryness. Mm -hmm. and in this situation, sometimes they might need a little bit of hormones. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes they don't. Sometimes all they need is some herbal medicine that can mm -hmm. help them to improve circulation to their vagina area, help them to improve uh, the uh, sebaceous gland development in the sense of secretion of lubricants. Um, that's something that we can definitely do. Um, and then you might have people that's in the 20s and 30s that comes in and which, you know, when you're in the 20s and 30s, you shouldn't have dry vaginal 
you know, situation, mm -hmm. uh, you should be well lubricated. Then you want to really thoroughly evaluate and take a look at uh, what might be the issue. And a lot of times we send them to a uh, OBGYN for a checkup. You know, do a vaginal uh, uh, pelvic ultra, uh, pelvic um, um, palpation and um, vaginal exam, mm -hmm. and then take a look at. It. And sometimes infection, for example, can cause the issue. And sometimes, um, you know, um, pap, uh, pap smear irregularities, mm -hmm. where that you have to do colonization, a surgical procedure. Sometimes that can impact uh, lubrication as well. So there's many different reasons. So we have to evaluate accordingly. Okay, that actually brings up an interesting point. What type of preventative things do we need to do in our 30s and our 40s as women? For instance, like starting to develop a, a family history profile. Um, like, what are the key things that we should be doing as steps that would be preventive care for ourselves as women? Well, first of all, I would say don't burn out. Yes. Women are now becoming a career woman. Mm -hmm. Okay, so career woman, it's fun is exciting but you know the truth is your body are not you can do it but you're not designed to do that yes you're really designed to have a child okay so absolutely you can definitely compete in the world in the sense with men in a sense of doing you know intelligent work being able to have a career no doubt about it there's not a doubt about it, but it's a choice because we only have a certain bandwidth in our energy mm. and in our purpose and meaning of our life. So choose wisely what you want to do. Mm. So I have people who work <clears throat> like 15 hour days. I said, why are you doing that? Mm -hmm. You should work hard, but not that hard. Mm -hmm. That is too hard. That's too much. Mm -hmm. You know, if you work eight hours a day, okay, the most, maybe 10 hour a day, mm -hmm. not so severe, not so crazy, then it's, it's still okay. But if you start to encroach into 12 and 15 hour days, I think that's excessive. <clears throat> so that's the first thing. I just want you to know in the background, I started seeing all of these little like hearts go up the screen. So I don't know who did it, but somebody obviously very much agreed with you. <laughs> oh, I tell you, I am not. I think there's one thing that I always want to tell my ladies is that we are not the same as men. Mm -hmm. We have biological differences. That makes women special. Mm -hmm. And don't lose that special. Because you don't want to be like man. You don't want to be like me. <laughs> I mean, I got my issues. Okay, don't like <clears throat> try to inherit my issues. Be yourself. Be a woman. Mm -hmm. And women are beautiful. <clears throat> you have biological differences. And that comes back to this very important thing. Yes. Is that I just came back from uh, a conference and uh and what we realize is that a lot of research that we do in this country a lot of times um male oriented research mm -hmm. subjects are men a lot of times subjects are male rats you know a lot of these laboratory animals we don't necessarily uh do um you know research especially basic pharmaceutical research mm -hmm. so what we realize is we start to realize there are certain distinct differences in how men and women reacts to medications yes so like you know if, uh, 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 there's a certain dosage that <clears throat> needs to be lighter mm -hmm. a lot of time need to be lighter there's a certain dosage need to be stronger so we are just starting to look at this area if you go to a National Institute of Health website, especially on the woman's health, you will see this is one of their prerogatives right now, looking into this issue and how we can balance out our research into the future so that women can be better served by properly you know, knowing um, the procedural medications and the seizure and their needs mm -hmm. are different than men. So I think that's important to talk about. Oh, absolutely. Well done. That's such a positive step for women um, because we are unique and, and we, need, we need care 
that, you know, I think, I don't know if it's the same for men, but women, because we're so emotional based, it's not just the physical care we need. We truly need to know in our hearts we're being supported, uh, particularly when it comes to medical conditions and medical awareness, um, because we feel it so deep in our bones. And that's the beauty of it. Being emotional is wonderful. It's beautiful. If you really look at it carefully, in a sense, is that what I often say, kind of like jokingly as a slogan, to estrogen is to worry. Mm -hmm. uh, to worry is with an O, not with an A. Okay, you don't want to be an A. You don't want to be a warrior. Warriors, not the men do that warriors thing. But estrogen help you to worry. The mm -hmm. reality is uh, being a good mother, you need to be a good warrior mm -hmm. with an O. Mm -hmm. Okay, a, a, a mother who don't worry enough, who don't worry well, um, it's problematic, you know? So in a sense, it's a guy, for example, we kind of like, go to sleep, we can like close our eyes, we're gone. A woman like will take them like minutes, well, no, my minutes, maybe like half hour before they go to sleep. Exactly. And they're like, okay, my guy is already snoring away next to me. I'm so fed up. This yep. is stupid. But that's yeah. how men works. That's, you know, that's how men, men just like, they just go to sleep. They don't, they, they worry, but they don't worry like women do. Mm -hmm. And we need our woman to worry. Oh my God, I mean, in some ways, you were born as a caretaker in some way. You are about to care for baby. Mm -hmm. I mean, I would say that I don't think men can do that work. We are not designed to do that work. Uh, we can, we can convert ourselves to do that work, but I don't think we can carry a baby. I mean, a man gets pregnant and have a child, forget it. <laughs> I mean, we would die from pain. We can't even handle a little things. Okay, I'll just speak for myself. I cannot speak for all the guys. <laughs> Uh, but so, you know, in some ways, that's a beautiful thing to estrogens to worry. You actually need a good warrior as a mother. Mm -hmm. And so I don't think that we, we pay enough attention to appreciate some of the beautiful things that women do have. For example, being emotional, yes. worry too much. Those are kind of things I actually think I can turn it around. Yes, yeah, so there are situations where you just do too much worrying and you, just, you need to find ways to balance that out mm -hmm. but normally regularly it's actually a beautiful thing it's a something that you don't want to lose and you don't want to just say oh my god i worry too much i should just be like him and that don't worry as much uh yes you can worry not as much but you need to worry because mm -hmm. we are relying on you to worry for us because we are not good at it mm -hmm. so own our feelings own our emotions absolutely Okay. Uh, may I ask you this? Do you mind, Dr. Dow, if we go just a little bit over? Do you have time in your schedule? Sure, no problem. Okay, so let's continue then. I want to talk about health in our 40s and then how our body is going to change after 50. So obviously 40 is a tremendous milestone for women. I would even dare to say for most women, 40 is a bigger milestone than 50. What do we start experiencing in our 40s and how do we manage that on both emotional and physical levels? A lot of women already feel changes in their hormones in the 40s. Yes. Okay. So they know and they sense the changes, for example, hair loss, hair yes. thinning. For example, they're having more wrinkles. Their energy is not as good. Uh, they are having more wrinkles on their body. Their body is drooping more. Um, their metabolism is a little bit slower. They are gaining weight. They are not <clears throat> losing weight as easily. Uh, their exercise, they cannot do as strong as before. Um, you know, some of these are natural, okay? Um, but you can definitely keep it up. You can definitely, you know, as if you have a good lifestyle, making sure that you exercise and having an active lifestyle regularly can always help. I think, again, it's just like in the 20s and 30s, the biggest issue that can really make you miserable and make you age prematurely mm -hmm. is stress, is stress. And I think that's the biggest thing. You need to find ways to deal with stress. If you have a lot of stress, um, you need to find ways to manage that stress and help you get rid of that stress. I often say, talk to your best friend, okay? Mm -hmm. 
find a good friend who can listen to you and help you to guide you and reduce some of these stress and stressors. And the second thing, if you don't, you know, you can always talk to a professional, you know, go talk to a, a psychologist, a therapist who can help you to identify the causes of, of some of your stress. Okay. So the second thing that you can do three, you know, get massages, get acupuncture, because a lot of times that can relax you <clears throat> and help you to, you know, deal with anxiety and depression. And that can help you also in dealing with stress. And then there are some people who just stresses out a lot. And sometimes it's more internal, it's more personality. And people who stress a lot tends to be people who have some depression or anxiety. And these are, these are the people. And by the way, that can be treated. Okay, that can be yes, treated. That's what I to ask you. Uh, and, 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 and that need to be treated because I can tell you right now, the number one disease in this country that we spend the most money on that has the most death or premature death is depression and anxiety. Mm. Okay. And uh, it's not a heart attack. Right. It's depression, anxiety, because that can lead to suicide. Mm -hmm. That can lead to uh, mistakes. That can lead to things that, um, that uh, we are not paying attention and that can kill us. And uh, depression actually increases heart attacks. Mm -hmm. Okay, so... And I'm talking about these very strong clinical depressions and that need to be addressed. That need to be addressed. And, you know, the way you can also tell is sleep issues. You know, a lot of times a woman start to have sleep issue in the 40s. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you can definitely, you know, <clears throat> talk to somebody and see a healthcare professional, see you the cause of your sleep issue. But otherwise, if it's due to <clears throat> some stress or nervousness or anxiety, you can take some melatonin. You can even take some herbal supplement. I think we have an herbal supplement called Sleep Calm uh, that you can take. Um, and we have, uh, for yeah, sleep. we have sleep and we also have a calm thing. I remember that. Uh, yeah. Calm sleep. Yeah, calm sleep. So that you can take it over the counter. And, um, and some more severe ones, for example, I treat regularly anxiety and sleep issue together mm -hmm. and the severe ones and usually a combination of acupuncture and herbs takes care of that. So okay. I want to say that make sure those things are taken care of, uh, manage stress, manage your emotions. Um, and then uh, um, understanding that in the 50s, um, you, you, you are going to be going through a transition coming up. So during this period of time, you know, tweak your lifestyle. Um, you know, if you haven't been exercising enough, time to exercise. We yeah. often say, Anti-aging regimens starts in the early 40s. Mm -hmm. Don't wait until 50s, okay? Okay. What's the difference between perimenopausal and menopausal? Um, there's a whole menopausal transition situation uh, that if you go on the website and uh, I'm a member of the North America Menopause Society and they have a whole chart that shows you <clears throat> basically perimenopausal is the time and sometimes we use the term perimenopausal transition. Mm -hmm. That's the time where your period is starting to get irregular um, and you're starting to have some of the symptoms like hot flushes and nice sweats. Um, and we call that a peri. Peri means around menopause. Okay. So the menopause might be, and some people menopause might be, hey, you know, you stop the period and your period just don't come. Okay. okay. There's, some period, there's some people like that. And there's some people that, you know, their period stopped and it comes back in three, four months, mm -hmm. right? So <clears throat> everybody does a little bit different, but at the end, always there's gonna be a cutoff day where the actual period is stop. So the definition of menopause is a retrospective definition. Mm -hmm. It's basically a definition of if you haven't had your period for one year. Okay. So one year. Um, so because that's long enough of a time where you're not supposed to get period. So you look back where you say, oh, I menopause one year ago. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Okay. So that's the definition of menopause. Mm -hmm. The menopausal, perimenopause or menopausal transition start around the time when you start to get some irregularity and some symptoms. Okay. So then how is a woman's body going to change when she is postmenopausal? 
Um, postmenopausal, if some woman goes through a menopause, it's like nothing ever happened. They just stopped their period and they have no symptoms. Right. Okay. And that is actually, that's actually quite a few patients like that, quite a few uh, people like that. I mean, you're talking about maybe a good solid 25 to 40% of people that have very little minor symptom and they go mm -hmm. away right away after their menopause, never get really much hot flushes, sleep okay. Uh, I would say that's a, at least a 25% of patients, one in four. Then there are people who has some symptoms and mild symptoms, and those are maybe another 25%. These are the people like a little hot flashes, a little nice sweat, uh, maybe a little urinary incontinence, don't sleep a sound, wakes up at night, go pee, uh, mm -hmm. skin a little dry, there's a little dry vagina, libido is a little low, gain a few pounds, you know, just some more like a little more milder symptoms. Mm -hmm. I would say that probably another 25%. Um, percent. Um, so, I mean, at the end of the day, the severe one, the severe people who have severe symptoms like hot flashes several times throughout the day, having nice sweats and couldn't sleep very well. And uh, um, those are people are probably 10 to 25% of the patients that I, that I deal with. And it may not be as high, it all really depends, but you do see uh, people like that. And, and those are the patients that really, really need some help. And some people actually need hormone replacement therapy mm -hmm. when they get really, really severe. And uh, um, so a lot of times they really need to consult their OBGYN. Uh, but I often, uh, and OBGYN does the same thing as I do, we all often have to assess cancer risk before you put, on, put somebody on hormones. Oh, interesting. So those work hand in hand then? Yeah, I mean, you know, if somebody who has uh, breast cancer risk, uh -huh. you know, like people who might have a, a mother who has cancer, uh, breast cancer at a certain age, or sister mm -hmm. might have it, or that they have tested the BRCA2 gene mutation is positive. Mm -hmm. So in these situations, a lot of OBGYN will not put you on hormones, and they will find other medications. For example, you know, recently they do a lot of gabapentin. Some come sometimes commonly called as neurontin. What that's is that? <laughs> I'm so sorry, I don't even know what that is. Yeah, sometimes that's helpful. You know, some people are helpful with that. But a lot of time, we we help a lot of patients. I treat a lot of moderate, median severity of hot flushes and nice sweats and menopausal symptoms because. Chinese medicine is very effective in those situations. We can help probably maturity, except the most severe ones. Okay. Um, and then what about in terms, again, going back to sexuality, how will a woman's sexuality, her arousal change as she's entering into, you know, 50 and up? This is a very hard question because in some ways, you know, sexuality, Sometimes there are individual sexuality. Mm -hmm. There is what we call communal sexuality. And individual sexuality is when you, if you're single, mm -hmm. or even when you're not single, and if it's just you are answering to yourself, okay? There's a lot of time when you go through menopause, your sexuality does decline for a lot of women. I would say majority of women. And a lot of women are comfortable with that mm -hmm. individually. They're okay with it. They don't mind it. They don't have as much issue. Some people have problem with it, but majority of time, they're okay with it. Mm -hmm. But communal situation might be different. You're in a relationship, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, you marry a young guy who's 20 years old. Well, I shouldn't say that. Let's say five years younger than you are. Right. The guy wants to have sex all day long. Mm -hmm. Well, you have a problem there, don't you? Okay, so in some ways, you might be comfortable with your sexuality. You have to take a look at relationship sexuality. You have to say, oh, you know what? I love my guy. I love my, 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 my partner here. I need to find ways to make my and help my sexuality to be stronger. Mm -hmm. So there are ways that you can do that for sure. So you got it. So when you're asking me about sexuality in the fifties, mm -hmm. you're asking me <clears throat> a question that's kind of loaded. It's more complicated. Okay. All right. So actually that brings it into, 
our question period. And I would say to everybody online, whether you, yes, <laughs> already it's pinging. Hold on one moment, your first question, Dr. Dow. Um, for those of you on Facebook, if you have questions, if you will please pass them over to, if you can write them in your chat boxes to Leah, she'll let us know if you're on Zoom. Um, please let us know. I also have some individuals that emailed in questions. So let's take this question first that I see on Zoom, and then I'm gonna go back to one of the questions I have uh, that was given to me as well. Um, so the question here is, what would be advice, remedy, or treatment for hot flashes in sexually active women in their 70s? Wow, okay, good for you. So what I would suggest is uh, first of all, I mean, there are different herbs. There's quite a bit of uh, uh, numerous different herbs that you can use. Mm -hmm. uh, but first of all, <clears throat> if you're in the 70s, the first thing that I do is to evaluate your health because there's a lot of different disorders that can have suppressive effect on your sexuality. Mm -hmm. For example, when somebody taking a blood pressure medication, Okay, that can dampen your sexuality. For example, somebody taking a very heavy dose of antidepressant, mm -hmm. that can also dose and depress your sexuality. So I think, first of all, I would take a look at just overall health first, okay? okay. And if you're pretty healthy, okay, then I would take a look at ways that I can help you to nourish you. I mean, there are several ways. There's mechanical ways. Um, for example, there are some uh, suppository that you can use uh, for your vaginal year area. <clears throat> Sometimes uh, OBGYN can, and they will actually give you a very small amount of estrogen. Oh, hold on, I'm not quite sure why we just froze. But when you have half flushes, for example, you can use um, a black coal hush uh, for moderate and mild uh, situations, you can use black coal hush. And that sometimes can be really helpful in uh, certain situations. Um, in Chinese medicine, you can use herbs such as Romania, Baked Romania is also another herb that you can use. But Chinese medicine, you tend to use in combination. So a lot of times you can use Romania, you can use Dioscoria, which is wild yam. Okay, you can use wild yam. Uh, you can use uh, fructus corny, combined with many different other herbs. Even goji berry for some people is very helpful. Okay, some people use this if you feel cold, your circulation is not so strong. Um, there is an herb called horny gold wheat, then you can also use that also. So there's quite a few of different herbs. I would do some research and I think it's important to talk to people and actually talk to a healthcare practitioner who um, does this kind of work in this area, whether it's a Chinese medicine uh, uh, doctor or a naturopath or an herbalist who is knowledgeable in this area, that's what I would suggest. Okay, thank you. Um, I hope that answered your question. If it didn't, please give us a follow-up question on it. Um, in the meantime, let me turn to the questions I received. Um, this might be along the same line, so I figure start with this one. I am 60 and have not had any interest uh, or sexual activity in years. When I try to masturbate, I can't get anything going. Um, this makes me feel really sad. I wasn't prepared to lose this part of my being in my 50s. I had a healthy sex drive before. I eat well, exercise, etc. Are there any routes out of this state of being? Hmm. Place. They said place. There is actually, um, as I was saying earlier, there are some herbs that you can actually take. Um, we actually have an over-the-counter thing, uh, I think so female spark. Mm -hmm. um, we do have, and there's some ingredient in there that could be helpful. Again, I would want to evaluate your whole health status first, making sure that you don't have any kind of, you say you're pretty healthy, 
Now just make sure, do some pelvic exam, uh, making sure everything is okay. Uh, take a look at your hormone profile. Uh, take a look at that. I think that's important. And then take a look at your mental health in the sense of emotional health. Are you happy in your life? Um, are you um, are you lonely? Are you in a relationship? Sometimes when you're lonely, sometimes mm -hmm. you, you're depressed. Sometimes you have a subclinical depression you don't really know. And uh, because that's why we call it subclinical, it's not on the surface. So sometimes that can also create obstacles. Then I would look at some vitamins and some herbs that can be really helpful. Vitamins department, um, I would say a general um, 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 uh, multivitamin is helpful, but there are other, you know, they are like the, the folate. Some people believe the B vitamins are very, very important. Vitamin D is very important. Um, there's some nutritional supplements such as coenzyme Q that give you a little bit more energy that could be uh, really, really helpful. And then again, there are other herbs such as horny gold wheat that can help to stimulate and get your nervous system going in the reproductive uh, region in the, uh, in basically uh, in your sexual uh, region, in the sexual zones. So um, that is something that you could definitely try. But there's a lot, it's, it's, it's not lack of herbs in a sense. It would be good just for someone to kind of evaluate you, take a look at your constitution and give you some idea what sets of herbs and supplements that you can take that would work better. Okay, thank you. I hope that answers that question. Um, here's a fun one. Kegels, do I need to do Kegels? I have to tell you that uh, this is a question from somebody, but I have to tell you the friend, the mother of one of my friends of, of mine, I remember her telling us all the way back in our early 40s, girls, do your kegels because you will appreciate that by the time you hit your 60s and 70s, which she was already in her 70s. Okay. Kegel, okay. I think, I think truly the kegel is an amazing exercise and you should definitely do some of it for sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. It can help you to firm up and help you to reduce occurrences of incontinence mm -hmm. as well as lifting. Okay, you can help that area. In the old days, in the Chinese culture, especially in very famous prostitute house in China, in the old China, I'm not talking about now. Mm -hmm. In the old China, where it was legal, it was um, a very important part of life for a lot of poet and literary people, mm -hmm. um, the prostitute actually goes through certain training. They actually train. Um, there is, you probably have seen um, these little iron bowls, this gold plate oh, of yeah. yeah. They call it a geisha bowls, okay? Uh -huh. Because, and then you insert it into your vagina because, and when you do Kiko, what happens, you kind of don't know whether or not you're contracting correctly or not. So in some ways, you, you need something to be inserted in there mm -hmm. so that when you do the contraction, you can feel, oh, I see when I'm contracting, okay? Mm -hmm. So a lot of times they have these ski shovels in the old days where, and they're small, they're not large. Mm -hmm. So you can insert it in there and do some uh, stimulation, do some uh, exercise with them. So my suggestion is do your Kegel muscle exercise, but if you don't feel like whether or not you're doing correctly, I think you need a little bit of device that you put it up there. Don't get a huge, massive vibrator and stuck it up there. Don't do that. That would just tear things apart. It's not good. You want to get a small insert. Um, some people even use a tampon, but you can use, I don't recommend tampon because you dry things up when you put in there. So mm -hmm. you can buy a, a small, um, shall we say a small vibrator. Don't turn the vibrator on, just a small vibrator. And that is easy to insert in there. You know, oil it so it's easy, so that insert is easy and don't create any problems. But when you like do contraction, then you can feel it. Um, I think for some people who couldn't feel it, once they have that, they can sense it much easier so they can tell whether or not they actually contracted properly. Interesting. So is that good for women as well that are postpartum that have, you know, given birth and they're trying to rebuild their vaginal wall and whatnot too? Yes, they can, yeah. but not right away because you've right got puerperian you got yeah. puerperian time where you're bleeding and you know everything's still open. You yeah. want to wait 
you want to wait until when that goes away. And that usually take about one month. Mm -hmm. um, but I would not do it right away either. I would just give another month, maybe two months total, like one month after everything's clear, mm -hmm. uh, because you just don't want to insert something funny in there too. But you can start doing Kegel muscle exercise without the insertion of any foreign object in there. Right. It's just that you don't know whether or not sometimes you can feel much, so you don't know whether or not you're doing it correctly. Right, okay. Um, Leah, do you oh, have we can oh. also add something. You can also actually go see a physical therapist. <clears throat> there are pelvic floor physical therapists that specializes in this. Oh, that's interesting. I didn't know that. Yeah, there is. Oh, I'm sure a lot of women would appreciate knowing that. I way. just haven't tried it personally for, you know, <laughs> but you should try it <laughs> if you need it. Okay. Um, I think a lot of my questions have been answered. Leah, do you have anything on your end? No. Okay. That's so it. I hope, I hope this is helpful to our audience. Oh, I believe so. Um, you know, certainly I see the feedback as it's going through. So I do believe so. I think that you covered a lot of things thoroughly. I'm going to ask you a reverse question and maybe we can end with this one because I think it's an interesting question. Um, and that is my husband's interest in sex has decreased a lot as we've gotten older. Mine has not. What can I do? Well, first of all, yeah. I want to take a look at the guy to see if there's some health issues. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because sometimes, especially when there's a dramatic change, then I will be concerned if there's some blockages, some mm -hmm. blood flow blockages. I want to check his heart. I want to take a look at his blood pressure. I want to take a look at his stress level. Um, because a lot of times uh, I have found personally, very simply, if I have less stress, mm -hmm. if I have more time, if I'm more relaxed, and if I'm on vacation, I have more sexuality. In mm -hmm. some ways, my libido comes up much more. And I think that's pretty much normal for most people. So that's the very first thing I would check. Check his health, take a look at his stress level, and then take a look at what he can do to help himself. So in some ways, he can go see a, a professional. He can see an andrologist. He can see a urologist. He can come and see me, see a, a doctor of Chinese medicine, naturopath, and uh, who specializes in sexual dysfunction as well as fertility issues. These are the people who takes care of this kind of uh, conditions. So that's what I would suggest. And of course, there are supplements you can take, but I always recommend see a doctor first and um, evaluate first, making sure there's no major health issue. Okay, thank you. And do we have any other questions from our Zoom participants or our Facebook participants? Okay, I believe that is it for tonight. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Dao, especially for going longer with us. But I mean, it's a fascinating topic. So I think that there are many people who enjoyed this right now live, and then it will continue to be in replay immediately for individuals to see on Facebook. And we will also upload this to YouTube um, at the beginning of next week. So that will be available on there for them as well. Well, thank you very much, and I, I thoroughly enjoy it, and I apologize I was a few minutes late. Thank you oh, very much. No, no problem. So uh, for those of you in the audience, in case you're interested, our next chat is actually next week. Um, it is with Dr. Dow again. It's our telestudy group, um, and you are going to be covering hexagram 59, I believe it is, from the I Ching, correct? Yeah, this is a <clears throat> tele-study group uh, with my father's book. So anybody who's a reader who is interested in Taoist philosophy, um, the foundations of Chinese medicine, we will be going through. Actually, we got Yi Jing book right behind here. Yes, so we do. Is, so we actually look at some uh, chapters. And uh, uh, next week, we will be looking at one of the chapter from this book. Mm -hmm. So that will be available to those of you that may be interested. That is a Zoom only um, call. It will be uh, an um, audio. It's audio only. Yeah, it's not yeah. videos, audio only. Yeah, yeah audio only. So um, please feel welcome to join that. Um, we will be sending out a reminder about that as we approach the date closer, but that'll be next Thursday. And that starts at 530, I believe. That's right? correct. Yeah. Okay. 
All right. Well, thank you once again. Thank you to all of you in the audience. We really hope that you enjoyed tonight. Please spread the word to friends. Um, we will be back with Women's Health and Fertility on November 1st. We're switching up the date a little bit for November. Um, so it's going to be November 1st at 5.15 p.m. And the topic is going to be uh, Fertility Myths Debunked. So we will be talking fact versus illusion of the many things that come up as individuals are beginning to think about their uh, fertility and conception plan. Um, so enjoy. Wonderful evening to everyone. Thank you again, Dr. Dow, and we will see you all in a month. Okay. Take care. Bye. Bye.